Welcome to In It to Win It. This is Steve Burton, and thank you for tuning in. We are here with Elisa Kakorin of Copernic Global Investments. Elisa, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, Steve, for having me. Yes, yes, it's a pleasure. Uh, okay, so you're the director of research. You guys have about six billion uh, AUM assets under management, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Right on. Um, and uh, you're you're out in Florida right now, right? We are. We uh, it's beautiful in Florida. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm a little jealous of your uh, government. I'm out in California. <laughs> <laughs> Many are. <laughs> Uh, all right, so you're a value investor. What um, uh, what sectors do you see uh, value in right now? We have explained to our clients that we see value really in two areas. Half of our portfolio is invested in mining companies, so real assets. So we have agriculture, uh, farmland. We have energy. We own mining companies, the majority of which are, are gold mining companies. And then the other half is more traditional value, which we have utilities, we have industrials. A lot of the industrials are in trading companies and railroads um, and and utility companies. And those were finding a lot of value outside of the US. Um, you can find high quality franchises for single digit PE multiples, half of book value. You just have to look um, outside of where everybody's focused on, which is which is the NASDAQ in the US. Um, yeah. So those are the two areas, the, the areas with the most upside are, are really in, in the mining companies and the real assets. Uh, nobody seems to believe that inflation is here to stay. We believe that inflation is the inflation of the monetary base. So that's more of the, the classical definition of inflation. And then what you see in the CPI is really the symptoms of that inflation of the monetary base. So we, as true and value investors, we, we go back hundreds of years and we, we, uh, we listen to what Richard Canelon says about inflation. And, you know, he, he described how money printing doesn't, it doesn't change things uniformly. There are winners and there are losers. And so um, in the early stages of money printing, you have stocks and bonds and real estate going up and everybody's happy. Now it's starting to migrate to the other parts of the system, including commodities. And so now we're starting to see the, the wage inflation and, and commodities. And, and now people are starting to, to see the, the, the negative consequences of all this money printing. Um, yeah. You can't have a... You can have a party without a hangover, really. Yep. Um, and unfortunately, we're we're kind of in that area. So where we're focusing on is is the areas that it, the money hasn't flowed into yet. Um, and when you think about, well, you have gold, which is extremely scarce. You have uranium. They're not you're not printing new uranium reserves. You're not printing new copper pounds in the in the Earth's crust. Um, so we're looking for what is scarce, what is valuable. Those should do well in inflationary environments. And luckily, the market doesn't believe that inflation is here to stay. So those are areas that are extremely cheap right now. Yeah. Um, okay. You mentioned emerging markets. What what uh, what countries are you focusing on? We have a significant uh, percentage in South Korea now. I some people find that as an emerging markets, it's really, uh, you know, it's hard to defend that in, in many ways, it's less emerging than some of the developed markets. Um, but they are trading extremely cheap prices. Korea Telecom is one of our larger holdings. Um, you can get that for six times earnings, oh. uh, less than book value. And so you compare that to a, a good dividend yield, you compare that to it's U.S. counterpart Verizon, and I mean, it's significantly cheaper. So <clears throat> those are the types of examples we're finding in really all sectors. Even in mining, the the premium mining companies, Newmont, you could go to South Africa or Australia um, and get very similar companies with a lot of reserves and resources, but significant discounts. Okay. Okay. What uh, you also mentioned farmland. Are are you um, are you doing those outside the U.S. as well? Or yeah, so okay. we have so palm oil is is our largest agriculture commodity. 
Um, and palm oil is, is great because the supply is effectively fixed. They're, unfortunately, in the past, these, these palm oil companies were, were bad actors and they were kicking people off of their land and clear cutting forests. And so that now has been put to a stop which is great for the palm oil price um, yeah. and palm oil demand for you know, edible oil demand keeps growing as, as population grows and as um, you know, the emerging markets get wealthier. So the supply and demand is, is really uh, favorable and the, the fundamentals are very good and palm oil agriculture land is trading for a fifth of the price that you would find in the U S um, so oh. these disconnects are, are, enormous really regardless of the sector yeah interesting yeah. okay i i was picturing you were going to say something like wheat or soybeans or something i did not imagine palm oil yeah right. oh huh. palm oil has has been on the esg bad list and so we say well undeservedly so like they had some they had some bad they did not do good things in the 90s however now you have companies, Golden Agri is one we own. I think they have several hundred people on their ESG uh, committee and they are, are not clear cutting forests anymore. And, and palm oil, their yield per acre is multiples higher than soybean. So okay. you're actually using way less land than you would if you were using the substitute of palm oil with, with soybean. So we think that there's actually some really good things happening from an ESG perspective that the market is missing. And I mean, but you do have to take on a geopolitical risk. I mean, these palm oil plantations are in Indonesia and Malaysia. And so what's the right discount for that? And that's a question we, we, you know, we ask ourselves of, of all the different countries we're investing in even in the U S what's the right level of discount that we want when we're, when we're investing in a company, the um, typically in emerging markets, we've said, all right, if, if the stock is worth $10, we think half off makes, <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. And then we only invest you know, when it's less than less than that, that $5 a share. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. And, um, Gold. Uh, so, what? Um, uh, what's, your, what's your base case uh, uh, for for gold? Gold is uh, one of our highest conviction areas. The, the mining companies we think are are some of the cheapest we've seen in thirty years yeah. relative to gold. Um, and gold, we think, is going to go up. Gold has been flat since two thousand eleven, and as we we talked about the inflation of the monetary base. Uh, eventually gold should keep up with that, but it hasn't. It's, you know, they historically have been very highly correlated, yet the monetary base is up multiples since 2011 and the gold price is flat. So if there's some sort of normalization to the monetary base, gold could go up multiples from here. Um, now the gold mining companies are interesting because even at today's price. So we don't even have to be right about gold. Even at today's price, the, the mining companies are trading below their liquidation value. And so then when you get this free call option on, on much yeah. higher gold prices and you get a lot more leverage with the, the mining companies. Now we caution our, uh, our client or, you know, anybody who's asking us about investing in mining companies. we say, well, you have to make sure that when you invest in mining companies, you're heavily risk adjusting because they are riskier than just owning the physical. Um, and then you have to diversify. We have close to 24 different mining companies within our portfolio um, because but, uh, you never know. We, we had one company where the, the government basically expropriated the mine. Um, okay. So yeah. there are some significant risks when you're when you're investing in the mining companies. Yeah, yeah. What's what's your favorite one right now? Oh, <laughs> well, I I one of the ones that has a lot of upside is is Seabridge. This okay. is a company that is sitting on close to ninety million ounces of gold, nineteen billion pounds of copper. It has a market cap of one billion. So even if you said okay, you know. 
they make a dollar per pound of copper, <laughs> the company's worth you know, one twentieth of what what it's uh, or that it's trading at one twentieth of what it's worth. So what anyway, we think this company is worth tens of billions of dollars. Um, however, it's a project that has not been built yet. It um, will require a, a lot of capex, but it's also huge. It's in Canada. It's shovel ready, so it has all of its environmental permits. But it needs a partner. So what is that? What is the eventual dilution going to look like? That's one of the biggest risks for Seabridge. Um, sure. But you know, there's there's a huge margin of safety right now, and and we think there's a, a lot of upside in Seabridge. It's sure. also an example of of where the market is. The market, even within gold miners, they're valuing cash flow today, and for longer term investors you can really get much more upside if you're willing to say, okay, it's highly probable that this mine gets built and we'll see cash flow. We, we may see it in five or 10 years. Um, but that's really where there's a significant amount of, of leverage to the gold prices. Yeah. Or companies that have already found gold. They're just sitting on it um, and they haven't been mining. Awesome. Um... What's your guys' cash position right now? I just got back from the um, Vancouver Resource Investment Conference, and I listened to about an hour-long presentation by Rick Rule, Grant Williams, and uh, Frank Gustra. And for about, I don't know, 80% of it, they talked about defense. And then Jay Martin asked him, he said, all right, let's talk a little offense right now. What, uh, what, what are you guys doing offensively? And they pretty much universally said, uh, yeah, we really like cash. We got about 30% position in cash right now. Treasuries aren't bad. What uh, What's your guys' cash position? 30 is high. Uh, <laughs> we, we're closer. We're north of 10. Uh, we're probably closer to, to 12 to 14% cash. Okay. We're, we're normally, though, below 10%. So this is a higher cash level than what we normally have. Now, this is just a residual of the process that we were never – saying, okay, our our target cash position is 15%. We trim and add all the time. And as, as companies, the share price rise closer to our risk-adjusted intrinsic value, we're, we're trimming because the risk is higher with the higher share price. Yeah, yeah. Um, so during up markets, which we've clearly seen over the last quarter, we we've been trimming a lot and there's yeah. fewer things to buy now during which so then it works out well because then in down markets we've we have more cash we have more you got capital. more capital to put to work exactly so okay. um right now our cash levels are high but um are higher than we normally have but we're still seeing plenty of opportunities and ways to deploy that cash okay okay maybe maybe i'm a little too conservative on our model portfolio now is about 30 percent um, but the, after hearing that speech, I thought, okay, maybe I'm not off. I, I don't know. <laughs> but and, uh, okay. it's hard, right? Because I mean, with the the U.S. markets are are so expensive still, and even with a, a correction, and and so maybe it takes everything else with it. Uh, who knows, right? Yeah, it, it might be the the right thing to to be thirty percent. But um, when we can find businesses that are trading for six times earnings and trading for, you know, some of these mining companies are worth four to 10 times what they're, they're trading at today. It's hard to, to time the market. You just don't know what. Yeah. yeah. How much cheaper is it going to get? Like at, at some point. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, silver. What, what's your uh, base case for silver? Well, platinum, and I know we'll get there too, but silver and platinum, both we, we look at what the historical gold to silver, gold, uh, Silver to gold ratio, gold to silver ratio, gold to platinum ratio has been um, silver. The the gold to silver ratio is is north of eighty, which is if you look over a long term chart is really high. Yeah. Um, and so, what is the right ratio? You know, one could argue somewhere between forty and sixty. Um, it's it was lower than forty in the nineteen seventies. But since then, it's it's been higher than that. So 
we use a, a 50 ratio. And so then you say, okay, well, even if just the, the ratio normalizes, silver should do very well. And then if we're right about gold and the, the silver ratio normalizes, uh, yeah. you know, there's, there's a lot of upside. In there's going to be a yeah, huge potential. Yeah. And same with platinum, right? Yeah. Platinum is trading at well below its, its normal ratio compared to gold. Yeah, that's uh, that was the inspiration for my uh, my background here with the uh, gold and platinum, yeah. and uh, so I'm kind of excited about this one. So, platinum, uh, I just looked it up uh, this morning. The ratio is uh, 0.52. So, in other words, you can basically uh, buy uh, two ounces of platinum for one ounce of gold, which, when you look back over the last hundred years, uh, is extremely rare. <laughs> right. And uh, yeah, I, I bought some. Um, of the uh, uh, Sprott Physical Platinum and Palladium Trust uh, in the last couple of days, and I got uh, the uh, Aberdeen uh, Platinum uh, right. Trust, and I thought, yeah, fifty percent is that's cheap enough for me. <laughs> I think, yeah. I, I think well, I'm picking up nickels in front of a steamroller here if I if I try to get it much cheaper than this. So. <laughs> well, you know what what is so interesting that we we found is that we can tell people, all right. Platinum, gold doesn't have to go anywhere. The ratio could normalize and platinum could double. But we don't know when. We don't know the timing. And so people, investors are, are in a funny place where they say, well, I, I prefer the certainty of a 3 to 4% bond versus an uncertain double. <laughs> yeah. So And so when, with, when we talk to our clients, our investors, just, we say, well, we don't know the timing. But when you have things that will go up, you know, multiples, you could, they could go, it could take 10 years for this to happen and you still get a, you know, a 7% IRR. We don't think it'll take 10 years, but it, it could. And you, then you still are, are better off owning platinum than owning a, a bond, especially today when, when inflation is, is so high and your purchasing power is, um, you know, the, the real yield is negative. Yeah, I talked with Rick Rule about this in person and um, uh, about about my uh, my platinum thesis, and he said that uh, you know your, your your floor is probably your your risk to the downside is probably pretty low. He said, but you know this has you know he he thought a thirty or forty percent chance that this this could go parabolic, especially if something happens with uh, South Africa or Russia. Do you guys feel because that, that's where most of our supply comes from? So if yeah. with all these sanctions flying around like candy, uh, it wouldn't take much uh, to sanction some obscure metal like platinum, and then this thing just goes through the roof. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, there's a huge amount of concentration and in, in mine supply coming from from South Africa. So, and it's not the most uh, I don't know peaceful place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of political risk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes yes um okay what um uh, do you have any other thoughts on platinum i was going to move to uranium no i uh, i mean platinum we we like the physical but we also own some of the the mining companies and impala is one of of our positions in platinum and that will have even more leverage to the, the platinum price and it's a company that's very well run dave our, our cio and i actually went and saw their their operations in Zimbabwe and South Africa. So it's an impressively, it's an impressive company. Uh, their operations are, are very impressive. And, and so that's one we like. Now, again, we, we heavily risk adjust that because it's in South Africa and you're, you're dealing with a mining company. But um, if your listeners are interested in, in a platinum company, that's what okay. Cool. They are. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, uranium. What's your uh, what's your base case for uranium? Uranium has been a, a, an area we've been invested in since 2013. So it's been a it's a long thesis for us. Um, and even back in 2013, the story was the same that demand the mine supply was way less than the the current demand and. We just didn't know when there was going to be some sort of price response, but obviously inventories and secondary supply from enrichment facilities, you know, that couldn't make up the difference forever. Now it went on way longer than we ever expected, but 
they did finally start to to bounce in 2021. And, and some of these junior mining companies went up 10x. Uh, Next Gen went up 10 times. Fission was up 10 times. Cameco was up multiples. Um, and so now we we still think that uranium is well below its incentive price. Uh, you probably need north of 70, 75 to $100 a pound to incentivize new supply, which you will need because demand is strong. And really, since, you know, with the invasion into Ukraine, um, people are starting to recognize that nuclear power is one of the best solutions for clean, carbon-free, very cheap power and baseload power. Um, so even... So Japan is restarting some of their facilities. Germany is even becoming more favorable to to uranium. You're having life extensions in the U.S. You're all the talk is the small modular nuclear reactors. Uh, China and India, all these countries and emerging markets are are building nuclear reactors. So demand is still robust, and then supply. It's, it's effectively flat. We haven't seen any new mines being built. So the release valve is is price and um, it could go, you know, we expect it to go much higher from here. So we own the Sprott Physical. We also own Kazatomprom. I mean, Kazatomprom is, has one of the largest reserve bases. It's the largest producer, the lowest cost producer. Lowest cost, yeah. You get, you get a very good dividend just to wait while you wait for the uranium price to to go up, which is inevitable unless you have some, you know, a second Fukushima or, or something like that. Um, but it, it seems that it, when you look at all this, the statistics, actually, uranium and nuclear power is some of the safest sources of it, of energy. So, so we are still very positive on uranium, um, but less so in the mining companies where. It, obviously it went from $20 a pound to $50 a pound. And so <laughs> those stocks have, have corrected from when we were buying them in 2018 and 19 and 20. So, yeah. What, uh, so you mentioned it briefly, principal risks. Uh, number one is probably another uh, three mile Island or Fukushima, right? Right. Um, can you think of any other principal risks that, uh, that we might be taking on by placing the bet? I mean, there's always risk that they, I, I don't know, substitute with something else. I think thorium people mentioned, but it seems that most of the investment is happening in, in uranium. Um, so I, I think from an investor's point of view, you know, it, it seems low risk. The mining companies are higher risk, obviously. Um, you've got a lot more going on there with geological risk and geopolitical risk. Management might do something to destroy value by allocating capital, uh, you know, ill-timed acquisitions or you know, bad dilution, something like that. So those are the risks that we think about when we're investing in mining companies. But we feel pretty positive on the, um, the, the uranium physical price. Now, how high does it go? That's another question is what is that incentive price? And then, you know, with a uh, Three Mile Island or Fukushima, maybe demand is, is much lower. And in that case, you get plenty of uranium at $50 a pound. Um, but the cost curve is such that it's very steep towards the the right end of the curve and um so if you have more demand than than you expect then the the incentive price could go much much higher than what we're talking about yeah it could overshoot yeah um what's your you mentioned because adam prom we have that uh we also got cameco what what's your thoughts on their uh recent westinghouse uh uh acquisition <laughs> It wasn't the worst acquisition. Um, you know, we've seen much worse from the mining companies, but it was curious to us because they are effectively selling uranium when they sell their shares. They're selling their uranium at what we think is too low of a price at $50 a pound um, and buying a company that is not a uranium miner. So it, 
doesn't seem to be in their wheelhouse. It's, but I mean, maybe it turns out to be okay. We would have preferred if they bought some of the, the other junior uranium mining companies that are trading um, very cheaply. And we've been talking to Cameco for many years about why they, you know, why aren't they acquiring some of these uranium companies? The next gen or? Yes, we've been, for years we were, we were saying, you know, and, and wouldn't it have had been nice if, if Cameco had bought next gen at $2 a share, yeah. right? Uh, now trading at six dollars a share so that would have that would have created a lot of value now i don't know if they could have gotten it for that price but um yeah they could have gotten super cheaper than what it is now though they could have been more aggressive in the in the bear market okay okay um all right um let's see oil gas do you guys have any um oil gas we have natural gas in the u.s we have a little bit of oil we had it we took a, we have industry limits in our portfolio, so we can't go over more than twenty five. And in twenty twenty, March twenty twenty, we went to the limit in energy. Yeah. Um, so we had a lot of uh, oil, a lot of natural gas, a lot of uranium still. Um, but natural gas in the U.S. we we like a lot. It you know that is also an area that we see a large disconnect between the, the price in Europe and the price of natural gas in the U.S. They seem to be effectively different markets because the supply was, was growth was uh, so large in the U.S. and we didn't have the LNG capabil- export capabilities. Um, they're building those. Also, the, the companies have been much more disciplined on supply recently because they had to, right? <laughs> they, yeah. they were losing money and investors were, were dumping their stocks. So, um, many of these natural gas companies are also up significantly from the bottom. Uh, th- these you know, Southwestern range were, were priced for bankruptcy and we were, we were buying as much as we could at that time. Um, so now we've been trimming though, cause they, they're up, you know, 10 X from the bottom. Yeah. We also got oil when it was a, almost free. After yeah, COVID, that was pretty cool. I mean, what a gift. When, when people say that the markets aren't efficient, <laughs> you can point to a, a lot of examples. Oil being negative 37 is, is one of them. Yes. <laughs> I'll pay you to take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Right on. Well, Elisa, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for coming on the show. If uh, people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to do that? You can look up our, our website, Copernic Global Investors, um, and that's probably the, the best way. Okay. There will be a link in the show notes. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for coming on, and you have a great rest of the day. You too. Thank you for having me. Yes.